Hello YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my Week 8 2016 NFL predictions. Well, this week for the uh, fanatic, it's been another typical week for about average to a little above average for the uh, NFL fanatic. Uh, so this week so far against the spread, I am 6-7-1. and one. Uh, which is one of the better records I've had over the last few weeks. And uh, straight up, I am 7-6-1. and one. So now overall for the year, I am 42-57-4 against the spread. And straight up now, I'm 59-46-1. Uh, so I'm getting, you know, about the same, just barely cracking about 500 or below. And uh, this week against the spread was one of my better weeks. Again, I'm taking Houston plus 6.5, so... If I can uh, get that, that will be my second week uh, since doing against the spread picks that I achieved a 500 record, so that will be an accomplishment. Um, so, I still think I can get the 60% by the end of the year, but it just, again, just a continuous week-by-week uh, -week process, and I'm hoping that over the next several weeks I can start getting above 500 by at least two or three games. Over the next two weeks, though, it's going to be very difficult due to the fact that there's only 13 games being played over the next two weeks. Um, so, uh, before uh, I, I start talking about what happened last week and the, the picks I have this week, I'd like to shout out uh, Paul Montgomery. Uh, he commented on my channel uh, last week and he told everybody to uh, check out his videos. Uh, he does, uh, from what I've seen on his channel, he provides a lot of information on rosters. He has the New England Patriots roster, the Celtics roster, the Cubs roster. So for any of my fans out there that don't know exactly every player on those teams, Check out his channel uh, and uh, and see how that goes. So there you go, Paul. There's a shout out there. Um, and hmm, let's see, uh, a few more shout outs. Shout outs to uh, Poet Rider. Shout out to Andrew Warren. Shout out to uh, Logan Schiff. He actually over the last couple weeks has beaten me in doing my uh, prediction, so I commend him for that. I can't do my picks on Sunday night because I'm watching the game most of the time that's playing, so kudos to him there, shout out to him, shout out to Geo Knows, tough loss for your Vikings, but I don't think the Vikings are that bad, and I think with a game against the hapless Chicago Bears, you'll be able to rebound very nicely, uh, shout out to Hatbox, Billy B, uh, Half Moon's Picks, um, Philadelphia, uh, First and Dante, Her Picks, Football Chick 794, and uh, a lot of great other prognosticators. Hang with Sean, Sean Ryan. Check out his videos. Uh, Mason Cole, The Electric Show, and any other prognosticators. Beetle Bailey. Uh, check out their picks because they are all great uh, prognosticators. Well, what a uh, crazy week in the NFL. Uh, I feel odd that this week and for another year I have a tie watching that Seattle-Arizona game. They... Had about 17 to, I think they had 19 punts in the entire game. And it was the first tie that the Cardinals had since November 9th, 1972. Uh, against when they were the St. Louis Cardinals. When they played uh, the Philadelphia Eagles. And here's another little, little fun fact about that game. In all three of the instances where you have a 6-6 six, six tie, the Cardinals franchise was involved in every single one of those games. So I thought that was uh, very interesting. And I know a lot of people were saying, well, Bobby Wagner, uh, you know, Bobby Wagner should have got penalized for jumping or grazing or, or touching the center when he jumped over um, the center. Actually, from what I've heard and from what I've seen, that's not the case. Um, that, what people are thinking was maybe that he, that you have to touch the center or you have to touch the player. No. To get the penalty, you actually have to either use their body as leverage for that penalty, or when you jump over the guy, you have to physically land on the guy uh, afterward uh, when it's done. So, in both instances, Bobby Wagner, even though he grazed the Cardinals center's uh, jersey, he did not go over him, he did not land on him, and he did not use him for leverage. So those were two legal plays from what I've heard, and I, I agree with that, because from what you see it, he never really impeded uh, the Arizona center's uh, control. Um, the Arizona Cardinals should uh, feel like they got robbed of a victory because they clearly outplayed uh, Seattle in every phase of the game 
Arizona had 441 yards of total offense. Uh, Seattle had about 250. Or, I'm sorry, they had 443 yards of offense. Uh, Seattle's offense at 257. Arizona held the ball for 46 minutes and 21 seconds. Seattle held the ball for 28 minutes and 39 seconds. Uh, Russell Wilson, uh, that was the worst game he has ever played in his career. Uh, bar none. That was an absolutely pathetic performance. He is having a bel average at best year, if you want to say that, but definitely below average to his standards. And I think that th this offense is going to be the hindrance of this sensational defense, which showed its might and power uh, last night by putting on that spectacular performance. Uh, Bobby Wagner was the MVP of that, that defense. 12, 12, unassisted tackle and 12 unassisted tackles and the two blocks. Uh, just absolutely incredible. Also, I want to congratulate Philadelphia for a big win over uh, Minnesota. Both offenses didn't look great, but <laughs> at the end of the day, Philadelphia's defense got a lot of pressure on Sam Bradford. They caused Sam Bradford, to, I think, to have six turnovers, four, um, four were accounted for. I know, he, I think he fumbled two other times, and it was just a big win for Philadelphia to have momentum going into the game against Dallas uh, next Sunday night in Dallas. All right, so time for my picks. So. This week, uh, the six teams that are on by are the Baltimore Ravens, the Los Angeles Rams, the New York Giants, the Miami Dolphins, the San Francisco 49ers, and the Pittsburgh Steelers. So if you have Mike Wallace, Joe Flacco, even though I don't know why anybody would have any Raven on their uh, fantasy team because we are the most overrated 3-0 team in the league, and this is one of the most uh, embarrassing free falls we've had <laughs> in our franchise history, but I digress. Um, when you, if you have L.A. with Todd Gurley of the Rams defense... Uh, the Giants, Eli Manning, Odell Beckham, Victor Cruz, the Giants defense, uh, Jarvis Landry, Ryan Tannehill, Jay Ajayi. Uh, also, I do want to say really quickly, Jason Myers commented on my video. I will give the Miami Dolphins a lot of credit. Uh, the Miami Dolphins have played very consistent football over the last uh, two weeks. Jay Ajayi became the second running back, or I'm sorry, the fourth running back in NFL history to have 200-yard games in back-to-back -back games. The other three running backs, I believe, were... Uh, O.J. Simpson, uh, Earl Campbell, and Ricky Williams. The last one to do it while he was Miami Dolphins, so good for them. Uh, he's also accounted for over 50% of his total rushing yards in the last two games. He's played 15 games in the last two games, counted over 50%. So I'm going to give the Miami Dolphins a lot of credit over the last two weeks. They're playing more balanced football. They're running the ball a lot more effectively, which is limiting the amount of snaps that Ryan Tannehill has to make or ha is... is uh, throwing under the ball, which is how you want to win games with a quarterback like Tannehill. Have him man you know, ma manage the game, make a couple good throws when he can, maybe have a busted coverage like they did with Kenny Stills on the deep ball. And uh, I think the Miami Dolphins, they found their identity. They found the running back that they want to use. I think this Miami team, they can slowly creep up on people in that wild card conversation if they keep playing this well. And with a game against the Jets, I feel like you have, you – you possibly, have, you possibly have a good chance to win, and I'm leaning uh, all towards taking the Miami Dolphins uh, to win that game. So there you go, Jason Myers. I hope that's enough credit uh, for the, uh, the Miami Dolphins' last two games, which have been uh, incredibly impressive and two wins that I did not think the Dolphins would pull up. All right, so there's all the rest of the shout-outs and all the stuff that uh, people have said in my last video. Now time for my picks. Uh, so on Thursday... This coming Thursday, when the 2-5 and five Jacksonville Jaguars, I'm sorry, the 2-4, uh, and four, wait, no, I'm sorry, 2-4 uh, two, yeah, two and four Jacksonville Jaguars go to the 3-4 and four Tennessee Titans. The Tennessee Titans are 3.5-point favorites this week. I like Tennessee minus 3.5 and, and straight up. And in the next game, when the 4-3 and three Washington Redskins go to the 3-4 and four Cincinnati Bengals in Wembley Stadium at London, so technically it's not in Cincinnati, it's uh, in London, but at Wembley Stadium. The uh, Cincinnati Bengals are two-and-a-half point favorites in this game. I actually like Washington plus two-and-a-half, uh, and the Redskins straight up. Then the next game, when the 4-2 and two Kansas City Chiefs go to the 3-4 and four Indianapolis Colts, the Kansas City Chiefs are two-and-a-half point favorites in this game. I like Kansas City minus two-and-a-half, along with KC straight up. And in the next game, when the 5-2 and two Oakland Raiders go to the 3-3 three and three Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the Oakland Raiders are actually one-point dogs in this contest, just like with Jacksonville. Uh, <laughs> they're staying in Florida this week, uh, which is a smart idea because I don't want to have to keep going from the West Coast to the East Coast and back. I actually like Oakland plus one in this game. 
uh, and Oakland straight up. And in the next game, when the 4-1-1 one one Seattle Seahawks go to the 2-4 and four New Orleans Saints, the, uh, the Seattle Seahawks are three-point favorites in this game. I like Seattle minus three, along with Seattle straight up. And in the next game, when the 4-3 and three Detroit Lions go to the 4-3 and three or 5-2 and two Houston Texans, the Houston Texans are two-and-a-half-point favorites in this game. I actually like Detroit plus two-and-a-half and Detroit straight up. And in the next game, when the 2-5 and five New York Jets go to the 0-7 Cleveland Browns, the New York Jets are two-and-a-half-point favorites in this game. I like the New York Jets minus two-and-a-half and straight up. And in the next game, when the 4-2 and two Green Bay Packers go to the 3-4 and four Atlanta Falcons, the Atlanta Falcons are two-and-a-half-point favorites in this game. No, 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 I'm sorry. That, that's a 4 o'clock game. Let me go to another game. Arizona and Carolina. Sorry. When the 3-1 uh, three, th three Arizona Cardinals go to the 1-5 Carolina Panthers, the Carolina Panthers are 2.5-point favorites in that game. I actually like Arizona plus 2.5, and, and Arizona straight up. And in the next game, when the 6-1 uh, New England Patriots Go to the 4-3 and three Buffalo Bills. The New England Patriots are 5.5-point favorites in this game. I like New England minus 5.5 and, and New England straight up. And then the next game, when the 3-4 and four San Diego Chargers go to the 5-2 and two or 4-3 and three Denver Broncos, the Denver Broncos are 6.5-point favorites in this game. I like San Diego plus 6.5, but I like Denver straight up. And then the next game, when the 4-2 and two Green Bay Packers go to the four and three Atlanta Falcons. The Atlanta Falcons are two and a half point favorites in this game. I actually like Green Bay plus two and a half and straight up. And in the next game when the four and two Philadelphia Eagles go to the five and one Dallas Cowboys, the Dallas Cowboys are uh, four and a half point favorites in this game. I like Philadelphia plus four and a half but Dallas straight up. And then finally when the five and one Minnesota Vikings go to the one and five Chicago Bears, um, Minnesota is five point or five point favorites in this game. I like Minnesota minus five, and Minnesota straight up. All right, time for my thoughts on each game. Jacksonville at Tennessee. Um, you know this game. It's one of those awkward AFC South games. For the last few years, they've always seemed to put this game on Thursday night football. Maybe you just want it's their prime time obligation that they have to give the Jags and Titans a prime time game. Uh. But when I, I look at this game, Jacksonville, they lack, they actually allowed, they put up 344 yards on offense and they allowed 344 yards on defense. So a pretty symmetrical game, you would say. Uh, you could argue that's good or bad, depending on how you would look at it. Also, uh, Blake Bortles uh, threw two interceptions in the game, even though one was not his fault. It was off Allen Robinson's hands. But now he is 1-12 in, in the 13 games where he's thrown multiple interceptions. Uh, I think one troubling stat for the Jaguars is this. Uh, Blake Bortles and Chris Ivory, their big free agent they signed from the New York Jets. At this point in the year, I know Ivory missed two games, but Bortles and Ivory have the same amount of rushing yards at this point in the year. When your quarterback is, has rushed them out the same as your free agent running back that you were excited to bring over, that's a huge problem. <laughs> and I think when you look at the Jaguars, one play summarized the entire year for the Jags in the Raider game. It was a fake, it was a botched punt by uh, the great punter for Oakland. I believe his name is Marquette King. Marquette King botched the punt, and somehow the play broke down well enough for him that he was able to actually run 27 yards on a 4th and 24 play to get the first down. I would believe that uh, BYU would like to uh, take some lessons from uh, Marquette King and the Raiders on how to properly or how to be able to convert a 4th and forever situation. But that pretty much summarized the entire uh, Jag season, and also just to make it worse, he was the second leading rusher for the Raiders uh, yesterday in that game, which is kind of unbelievable that the punter would be the second leading rusher. Uh, but I digress. But this Jaguar team, they're playing a Titan team that has had its highs and its lows, but pretty much, <laughs> you know, you don't know exactly what to get. Uh, Mariota's been uh, pretty incons you know, pretty inconsistent. You know, he's had some good moments. And some bad moments, maybe a few more bad moments than good. But when you look at what happened yesterday, the Titans, Taylor Lewan had a 10-yard touchdown pass. 
He was the first offensive lineman with a receiving touchdown since Donald Penn did it for the Raiders in 2014. And just looking at how Mariota, you know, distributes the ball passing, it's not really, you know, that impressive. He hasn't really had that many consistent games. The one consistent thing that the Titans have been able to do is run the ball pretty effectively. DeMarco's had, DeMarco Murray's had three 100-yard rushing games. Uh, this year, last year, he only had one, and he's, he's had a career resurgence. And it's showing to people that he's not maybe as good as he was in Dallas behind that offensive line, but he's better, but he's better, and he's a good running back to have for this system. And he's showing that he's not the running back in Philly either to be that bad. Um, but tough break for uh, the Titans, who have lost 10 straight games to Indy. And I think one of the biggest problems, too, is that they've caused the fewest fumbles in the NFL. I found that was very interesting. The Tennessee has caused the fewest fumbles in the NFL. And um, with what happened uh, yesterday, actually, Mariota uh, coughed up a fumble that basically ended the game for uh, Tennessee. And also, this is one of those hard games. Uh, Tennessee's at home, and they've only won two home games over the last two years, but one of them was against Jacksonville. They split the last six games in this series, and just looking at the Titans, I've just been more impressed with the Titans <laughs> in a sense of they've been competitive in pretty much every one of their games. I know they can run the ball effectively. Their defense can play pretty solid for the most part in most occasions. Um, and Jacksonville, they were one Tracy Porter touch away from losing to the Bears and only having one win. And just looking at these two teams, I've seen the Titans fight, and this is a Jags team that's not very good. They've won this game at home last year. I feel confident they can do it again this year just because the Titans have more talent and more confidence and are in a better position to compete for the South than the Jags, who just look like an absolute uh, disappointment uh, for their entire uh, fan base and franchise, who had pretty uh, decent expectations for them to either have a winning record or make the playoffs. So with those uh, in mind, that's why I feel confident. Tennessee's running game, their defense is playing better. Jacksonville, I'm just not sold on offensively. Blake Bortles continues to make mistakes. They're not running the ball well. In Tennessee, just at home, that's enough for me to say, take Tennessee minus three and a half and Tennessee straight up. All right, the next game, uh, Washington at Cincy from London. Um, I want to congratulate the Bengals. Well, okay, let me put it this way. The Bengals did their job and beat the Browns. Uh, but they did it pretty impressively on all stats. Again, you, the, the stats are inflated because they're playing the Browns, who are the worst team in the league. Uh, Jeremy Hill ran for 168 yards on nine carries. That is the third most amount of yards in 10 or fewer carries in NFL history. So, uh, pretty impressive day, even though he hurt his wrist at the end of the game. Hopefully he can play in this game against uh, Washington coming up because they will need him. It's also the first 100-yard rushing game for Hill since Week 16 of the 2014 season. Um, I also want to congratulate uh, them. They've uh, beat Cleveland up four straight times. Um, so that's a you know good streak to have, especially in that uh, interstate rivalry. <laughs> the Bengals and Browns uh, definitely don't like each other. But at least for Cleveland fans, they have the Indians. Uh, so... And good luck for them and the Cubs in the World Series. Uh, game one is on Tuesday, but I digress. Um, also, A.J. Green, he had another sensational game against this uh, Cleveland team. He is the sixth player in NFL history with three 150-plus yard receiving games in their first seven games. And also, he caught that spectacular Hail Mary, uh, which summarized the Browns' season uh, to end the half, which pretty much put the nail in the, in the Browns' coffin there. They're playing a Washington team that you just don't know who you're going to get. Like, for the first time all year, Washington gave up less than 100 yards on the ground in back-to-back -back games, uh, which has been very tough because they've had one of the worst running defenses in the league for most of the year, so kudos to them there. Um, also, but their four-game winning streak was snapped, but also it was just where they had opportunities. Dustin Hopkins misses a 46-yard field goal that goes off the upright. They're within the five-yard line, and... Uh, I think it was a Matt Jones. Matt Jones fumbled the ball within the five yard line that gave the Lions the ball uh, that could have that cost them a touchdown at that point. Uh, also, um, they had the one fumble where Cousins just botched the snap, and that was within the Detroit 35. So there were two big turnovers there, which could have helped the Redskins feel a little more confident and got the victory. Um, again, they lost Josh Norman in the third quarter to a concussion. I think that was big because after that Marvin Jones play, they. Uh, Pretty much, and that last drive, they pretty much had nobody uh, to uh, defend any of their receivers. Even though that was pretty sad to see a 37-year-old Anquan Bolden just run up the seam like that to uh, uh, 
uh, win the game. And also, I do want to give Kirk Cousins credit. He had an 18-yard touchdown run with about 40 seconds to go. Um, I think that is the longest Redskins quarterback rushing touchdown since RG3 is against Minnesota back in 2012. Um, and the Redskins run defense, and they've given up the second most yards per running attempt. Uh, and they're playing a sensi team of Bernard and Hill. That that's definitely going to be a problem. Um, and they've lost four or five against Cincy. But I'm taking Washington here because I just haven't seen a team that Cincy's beaten that I've been impressed with. They beat a 2-5 and five Jets team. They beat the Browns. And they beat the Dolphins. Okay, and you could argue at that point the Dolphins were nearly as good or looking as they are now. So, looking at the Redskins, they've been pretty consistent for most of, you know, besides, you know, the first couple weeks. They've been pretty consistent the last five weeks for the most part. And just looking at the Cincinnati team, when they played better competition in the games against Pittsburgh, Denver, uh, Dallas, New England, they've, they've lost those games pretty convincingly. I, I think Washington's a team that they're not going to do that against the Cincinnati team who needs this win uh, desperately, you know, just to, you know, have any confidence and stay in the uh, North picture, in the AFC North picture. But I just think Washington... Cousins has been playing better. He has more talent around him. Hopefully Jordan Reed can play in the game. I think that the Cincinnati defense, they're going to have a tough time with uh, the uh, Redskins receiving core. Hopefully Norman can play. I think if Norman can't play, that's a huge advantage for A.J. Green <laughs> going up against the Redskins secondary. But I, I just think at the end of the day, Washington's just been more consistent, and they have more defensive talent. They've, just looked, they've had more impressive victories and uh, performances than Cincinnati has this year. And I have enough confidence to say with them going over to London, that uh, Kirk Cousins will put together another solid performance and the Bengals will just come up this short uh, to win the game uh, for Washington. Uh, so that's why I'm taking Washington plus two and a half and uh, Washington straight up. Next game, Kansas City at Indianapolis. Kansas City, they're, they're back on a roll and they're back on playing solid football. They've... Uh, won uh, back-to-back games. Um, they've won nine straight at home, which is the longest active home winning streak in the NFL. And they're four away from tying their all-time record, which was 13 straight home wins uh, from 2002 to 2003. Uh, also, Alex Smith, another efficient game by him. This is a little fun little stat I found out. Alex Smith loves throwing screen passes, as uh, are screen, screen touchdowns. He's thrown 15 screen touchdown passes over the last four years. That is five more than any other QB in the league. But that kind of fits Alex Smith's uh, profile. He's not a guy that's going to take a lot of deep shots. It's, he's not a guy that's going to... He's not a really, you know... Even though he had that one throw to Tyreek Hill that uh, was a big score for the Chiefs there. But he doesn't throw the ball deep. And screen passes are really his best friend. He just throws it to the running back or the receiver and they do 99% of the work. <laughs> Which is kind of efficient for Alex Smith. Um... So, and also their defense is being uh, great as well. They, they, they recorded their six pick six uh, since 2015. That is the most in the league over the last two years. And Marcus Peters, what a stud he's been. He's been one of the best corners in the league over the, since he's come in with 13 interceptions in the last two years. That is best in the league. And I, I think that he is going to be a cornerstone corner for them for years to come. And he definitely at one point will, will be considered the best corner in all of football. If not, you could you know you could argue over the last two years he is one of right now. Um, and they're playing a uh, even though they played the Saints defense, which is the Saints defense, one of the worst in the league, but still a pretty impressive performance uh, to uh, by all phases to win that game. Where Indy, um, Andrew Luck, he's now eight and zero against Tennessee Titans. That is the first opponent or first QB the Titans have allowed uh, their first eight games to win against. Uh, in franchise history. And also, I'm going to get, uh, congratulate Robert Mathis. That was his first defensive TD since 2008, uh, which sealed the game for them. And when I look at... Uh, and it wasn't a, a very pretty game for Indianapolis either. They had 12 penalties for 131 yards. That was the third most in franchise history. Uh, and I also want to congratulate... Um, Adam Vinatieri, he broke a, another former goal. Mike Vanderjack's all-time consecutive field goals made record at 43. So kudos to Adam Vinatieri for having, you know, the best. He's the best kicker in NFL history. He will get the scoring record because he's uh, dead set on getting it. 
And it's just unbelievable, especially after seeing the Seattle-Arizona game, how valuable having a kicker like Adam Vinatieri can be for any <laughs> NFL franchise. Um, and this is a very interesting matchup. Kansas City, they've only uh, accounted for eight sacks going uh, into this week, which is tied for dead last. They're playing the off they're playing the worst offensive line in the NFL, and Andrew Luck's been sacked the most at 25 times. So this is going to be Kansas City's opportunity with the talent they have at pass rushers with uh, Tamba, with Justin, with Derek. Oh no, I'm sorry, Justin Houston's not playing. But with Tamba, with Derek, with Jay Howard, they have a talented front seven that should get a good amount of pressure on uh, Andrew Luck, which will cause uh, him a lot of duress and struggles. Uh, but I'm taking KC here just because KC's a more complete team. Andrew Luck's having, to me, uh, to my opinion, the best statistical year of his entire career. Uh, shout out to Paul, shout out to Paul Ryder again. He gave me this great stat. Andrew Luck uh, yesterday against Tennessee completed nine passes of 15 or more yards. That's second in the league this year. The only other quarterback to complete more passes of 15 plus more yards in a single game was Brian Fitzpatrick with 10. Uh, and I, I think again with what he's been able to do. Hasn't nearly turned the ball over as much. I think he has like 15 touchdowns, four interceptions. He's ha he's having a sensational year. But just looking at how this whole team is, the rest of the team isn't really doing anything. They really can't protect him. Their defense is giving up way too many yardage and, and way too many plays. Remember, just a couple weeks ago, they blew a 13-point lead with five minutes to go. They were only the fourth team in NFL history, uh, or the fourth team since uh, 94 over the last like 25 years, to blow... That kind of game. Uh, so, to me, when I look at Kansas City, I think Andrew Luck is the better quarterback, and he's been having a much better year than Alex Smith, who's playing a fishing ball with seven TDs and one interception. But Kansas City just has more of a balance in a running game, a better offensive line to work with, and a defense that is going to cause Andrew Luck a lot of havoc and duress, which will be the difference in this game. And also KC... Uh, they're angry for what happened last uh, the last time they played them. <laughs> that was the playoff game that Kansas City blew the 28-point lead, and that was Andrew Luck's signature playoff victory uh, by beating them, I believe, 45-44 to after he thrown three interceptions going into the third quarter. Even though Indy's won six of the last seven, but like but like I said, just but like I just said, with Casey's defense and just more talented overall team, I think Kansas City can go into Indy against this Indy team and get a victory and exercise some demons from uh, that 2013 uh, fiasco. <clears throat> so that's what I can't see. Minus two and a half. And can't see straight up. Next game, Oakland and Tampa Bay. Derek Carr. He's thrown 18 touchdowns of the two-minute warnings of either the first or second half. That is the best in the NFL since he's come in at 2014. Uh, the Raiders are also 4-0 uh, for the first time on the road since 2000. And their 5-2 and start overall is the best since 2001. So, the Oakland Raiders right now, I watched their game yesterday. That was the most solid game by the whole team I've seen this year. They only, uh, they only stopped uh, Jacksonville to have 16 points, and they scored, I believe, 33. If they can keep playing like that, I'm not very certain on it because, you know, it was Jacksonville. But if they can keep playing at that kind of level, this Oakland team will be a serious threat in the AFC and to anybody uh, trying to make the playoffs because they are young, they are motivated, and they have – an extreme amount of confidence and talent, and a you know gutsy head coach uh, to provide a uh, interesting uh, run for the AFC. So kudos to Oakland there, and also kudos for Tampa Bay uh, for especially Jack Wiz Rogers. First time in his career, he's had two 100 uh, yard games. He is the fourth running back in the last 10 years for the Bucks to have consecutive 100 yard games uh, in a season. The other, the other three guys were Ernest Graham, the Garrett Blunt, and Doug Martin. So for the last 10 seasons, those are your four guys that have had consecutive one of your games. So kudos there. And also kudos uh, to uh, the Bucks. They snapped their 10-game losing streak against the NFC West. Last time they won uh, against the NFC West was week 16 of the 2010 season. And the last time they just won on the West Coast in general was 2012, week 9 against Oakland. And it's the best start for the Bucks since 2011. Uh, for Tampa but I'm, I'm taking Oakland here just because Tampa, they beat San Francisco they beat Carolina and they somehow beat Atlanta Oakland, they've just been more consistent with how they've been playing Derek Carr's been playing 
much more efficient ball than uh, Jameis Winston has. I think one interesting advantage will be can the Raiders run the Bucks defense? Because the Bucks defense has done a pretty good job for the most part uh, holding running games in check. Um, and but I think the, uh, with how Jameis has played, he's uh, thrown a lot of interceptions, and the, and the Raiders have a secondary that uh, can cause a few of the, can cause a few of those to change the game. And I, I just like again that Oakland's four and zero on the road, and they're three and zero on the East Coast because they've gone to Tennessee, Baltimore, and uh, Tennessee, Baltimore, Jacksonville. And uh, I'm trying to think of what was the other road game they had, um, and New Orleans. I'm sorry. Yeah, they've gone. Our, they've gone on four trips on the East Coast, and they've won all all of those games. And they're staying in Florida, like I said earlier. So I have enough confidence to say, uh, with that, that Oakland should be able to win another pretty solid performance against a Tampa team that will give them a fight, and they have some confidence, and they still have a shot. But they're not better than this Oakland team. So that's why I like Oakland plus one, uh, and Oakland straight up. Next game, Seattle at New Orleans. Um, uh, I already talked about the Seattle uh, New Orleans game earlier, uh, or the Seattle Arizona game earlier, uh, and it's just been a rough time for uh, Russell Wilson. Uh, Russell Wilson in three of his six games has not thrown an off offensive touchdown. In the previous four years of his career, he had no games where he didn't throw any touchdowns. He's played seventy games. The first sixty-four, he always threw a touchdown. Last three games, or he's, he always accounted for a touchdown. Last uh, three of the last six games, he hasn't. And for Russell Wilson, this is the worst year he's had since his rookie year, and he's playing average at best. And if I had to give him a grade for uh, last night's performance, I'd give him a D minus. That's how bad he played. And like I said, that is the worst game he's played in his entire career. Um, but this matchup is uh, quite simple to me. Seattle's defense is the best in the league right now. Uh, they're number one in points per game, six in yards, second in passing touchdowns, and fourth in rushing touchdowns. But just after that performance last night, where, again, you know, I already talked about the yardage and timing, but to only hold your opponent to six points, especially the Arizona Cardinals, that was incredibly impressive. And I don't think anybody today, today, you know, maybe not next week or tomorrow, but today can say that Seattle does not have the best defense in the league. However, they are going up against the worst defense in the entire league in the uh, New Orleans Saints. Uh, even though I do want to give Drew Brees some credit, uh, he's the first QB in NFL history of 100 300 yard passing games. Congratulations to him. That's a testament to consistency and just how dominant he's been as the Saints quarterback for all this time. Even though, unfortunately, his defense isn't helping him stop anything. And I feel bad for him because he's now become Phillip Rivers and he'll put up a lot of great numbers, but his defense... Just can't do, just can't stop anything, which causing him to lose. Um, but the Saints defense, on the other hand, it's the most. They allow the most points. They're 29th in yards, the 30th in passing yards, and they give it the most rushing touchdowns in the league. So I feel like if Russell Russell Wilson need Russell Wilson is playing a defense to his strength, and he has this defense behind him, that he should be able to carve up this. Uh, New Orleans defense uh, very well uh, because I think every team that New Orleans has played at home they've given up over 30 points yeah or 35 40 yeah they've given up over 35 points a game in every one of their home games so far I believe which is unbelievable and then I think the Seattle offense they played San Francisco earlier and they played the Jets and they put up 27 they put up 35 on uh, New Orleans or uh, they put up 35 on San Francisco and I just think with just how Seattle is, their defense will do enough to where their offense can overtake New Orleans' defense. And they'll have some confidence and feel better about themselves in a uh, big-time win, in a big-time just relaxing feeling before they uh, play a very uh, tough Buffalo defense in Seattle Monday Night Football next week. So I'm taking Seattle here just because I think New Orleans can, they can put up points in the Legion of Boom. They can because Drew Brees is that good. He's played his defense enough, and he has enough talent, and they're in that dome. But Seattle's defense will shut them down enough to where I, I just believe in Russell Wilson. He, he won't have to move. They don't generate that much pressure, and he'll just put up a lot of points with the speed weapons he has, a tight end, uh, receiver, tight end at receiver. And I think Christian Michael will have a great game on the ground 
against one of the worst running defenses in the league. And also for Jimmy Graham's sake, he gets to go back home to his former team in New Orleans, and I guarantee you he's motivated to put on a show. So that's all I like Seattle minus three over New Orleans. Detroit over Houston. Detroit's won 30 straight, and in all four of their wins, they've trailed in the fourth quarter. Uh, so that's incredibly impressive for uh, Matthew Stafford and that offense and that team. They have that much uh, fight and resolve to get those victories like that. And also, it's Matthew Stafford's 22nd fourth quarter comeback in his career. That's the most since 2011, and second most in the league since 2009. Uh, the only other QB I believe that has more is Matt Ryan. And uh, Stafford's uh, stats overall have been spectacular. He has completed 68% of his passes, 1,914 yards, 15 touchdowns, 4 interceptions. I think there's only two QBs that I could argue right now that are better than him and are in the MVP conversation, which are Matt Ryan and Tom Brady. And I put Matt Ryan at 1, Brady at 2, and then Stafford at 3. Um, Houston, uh, Houston's playing a rough game. And I think it's going to be interesting because Detroit has one of the worst running games in the league, but they're playing one of the worst run defenses in the entire league. Uh, they're 28th in rushing yards, and they're 30th in rushing touchdowns given up. That is Houston's run defense. And no Houston receiver has more than 354 yards receiving. Uh, the tight, I think the tight end actually is leading their team, which is kind of sad, especially when you have DeAndre Hopkins and Will Fuller. But this Houston offense is just too anemic enough, or just too anemic for me, to have any confidence in. And I just like how Detroit's playing. Uh, Darius Slay, that's a big injury. Hopefully he can come back, or hopefully he can play this week, and he'll be a big addition. But I just look at Detroit and Houston. Detroit is playing at a much more consistent level, and I just trust Stafford right now over Osweiler. And I think Stafford has more talent, or Stafford will be able to use Bolden, Jones, and Tate more than I think Osweiler will be able to use Hopkins and Fuller in this game, and I think that if they can, you know, get a little bit of a running game going, especially against this bad of a uh, run defense, I think Detroit will be able to go into Houston. Houston's won two of the three meetings against them, and they and Detroit's never won in Houston. I think with how they've been playing, I, I just have enough faith in the Lions to say, you have the quarterback, you have the offensive line, which is doing pretty well. Excuse me. You have the defense with uh, you have the defense with uh, Slay, uh, Whitehead, um, Quinn, and all those guys to put a, a good amount of pressure on Osweiler, who against uh, solid teams has looked pretty bad. I, I think that he'll play better against Detroit than he will tonight against Denver. But I just like Detroit's makeup as an as an offense. Uh, Houston maybe to run the ball a little bit better because they have the better running back. But besides that, Detroit has just a better overall team. And when it comes down to it, I just, just trust Stafford over Brock Osweiler in a game like this. <laughs> so that's what I'm taking Detroit plus two and a half and Detroit straight up. Uh, then the next game, uh, Jets at Browns. The Jets snapped an eight-game losing streak against the Ravens. And just for a fun fact, that is the second win they've had overall. We played ten games. That's only the second time they've beaten the Ravens. Uh, how sad for my team, but I'll talk about the Ravens next week. They're on a bye, so thankfully I don't have to talk about them. <laughs> uh, so, congrats for the Jets for snapping that streak. And it's the first win at home for Geno Smith since week one of the 2014 season. I know that's a cheap stat, but at the end of the day, Geno did start the game, so he got the victory. I hate that about football, because I've always wanted the quarterbacks to be like pitchers. If a quarterback gets hurt and they don't win or they're not leading, the other, when the other quarterback comes in like Ryan Fitzpatrick, Ryan Fitzpatrick should be able to get the victory and not Geno Smith. Because he was the one that won the game. He threw for more 120 yards. Touchdown, no interceptions. Uh, played a pretty solid game in relief. Um, and also, it was the first 100-yard game for Matt Forte since week two of this year. And he had an identical stat line. He had 30 rushes for 100 yards. Uh, and I know he had three touchdowns in the game against Buffalo. He had 30 rushes for 100 yards and one touchdown against us. Uh, and also, I'm going to give credit to Quincy Inunua. 69-yard touchdown pass by Geno Smith. That was the longest pass by the Jets the entire year. Which uh, hurts me because, again, that's just a hard thing for the Ravens to give up that many kind of bombs uh, week after week after week. Um, also, I, I want to... Uh, and then they're, See, the Jets have a little bit of momentum, and they're playing the worst team in the league in the Browns. Kevin Hog Cody Kessler went down for concussion. Hopefully he's okay, but he might not play, which means Kevin Hogan may get his start, and he'll be the 27th different quarterback the Browns <laughs> will start since 1999. 
Uh, and he'll be the fourth quarterback they've started this year. And Kevin Hogan actually already made some history. He had the 28-yard touchdown run, which is the longest run by a, a, the longest rushing touchdown by a Cleveland quarterback in franchise history. <laughs> um, and I think here is a stat that's very interesting, and it could tell what the Browns are in store for. Uh, six players have thrown a snap at QB for the Browns in their first seven games. That's the most since the 1976 Bucks, who went 0-14. And if how the Browns have been playing, I'm sorry that 0-16 record is looming up nearer and nearer. And every loss that they get, it's just more confidence that they'll lose and lose. And they'll possibly tie the Lions. At least they're not first, but tying the Lions with that 0-16 record, that would be a very hard pill for the Browns to swallow. And I think a lot of changes are going to have to be made. Even though, again, I feel bad for you, Jackson, but if you told me after an 0-16 season... You might want to fire the coach. I don't know if I can necessarily blame you. Even with all the stuff they've had, they've had opportunities to win games, and they've just had awkward situations where they've not managed the game properly in some ways, which uh, goes on coach. But I digress. The Jets have also won three straight against the Browns. Even with how the Jets have been playing, they have a little bit of confidence. They have Ryan Fitzpatrick going. Fitzpatrick will be better than Hogan or Kessler. The Browns are banged up. Joe Hayden's not playing. Or, you know, their one safety went out with a kidney injury. Hopefully he's okay. And I just think, again, the Jets the Jets are just better than the Browns. They've won, they've won two games, and they just beat us. And I think that with the Browns, they're just hoping to fight. If they get a win, good for them. If they don't, oh well. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that's why I'm taking the Jets minus two and a half straight up just because the Browns are the worst team and they're just trying to hope for a victory where I know the Jets they've tasted victory and they're just better than the Browns <laughs> uh, next game um, Arizona and Carolina uh, and also or one more quick thing on the Browns uh, they're, ha they're on the verge of having their worst start as a franchise since the 1975 Cleveland Browns when they lost eight games to start that year as well all right, back to the uh, Cardinals and the Panthers. Uh, David Johnson, second in the league in rushing, and he has the most scrimmage yards in the NFL. Uh, so kudos to him. He's been a sensational running back over the last two years, and he's been one of the biggest reasons why I think they've, they're have they in the spot they're in. Uh, Larry, and also congrats to Larry Fitzgerald. Uh, throughout the game, he surpassed Chris Carter for 13th all-time receiving yards. What a tremendous accomplishment for the greatest player in Cardinals franchise history and a absolute legend in Larry legend. Uh, kudos to him, and he will continue to climb up that list as uh, time goes on. Might not be that might not be that much longer, but um, but let, but good luck, Larry. Hopefully, you can continue your uh, great success. Always root for Fitzgerald. Um, and also for uh, Arizona, this was a tough game for them. Uh, they have the fifth best defense and second in yards per game. And again, they should have won that game. I've already talked about the game. I won't mention anymore. And they're playing a Carolina team. Not only do they have the motivation of, you know, the anger of the tie, but they're playing the team they lost the NFC title game, 49-15, to and a team that just, if they, if they had one, if they had any hope or any, you know, confidence in them, I think the Cardinals, you know, the angry red birds are going to knock it out of them. Um, because when you look at the Panthers, this is the fourth time in the last seven years They've started 1-5, and five, and this has just been an absolute disaster. Uh, here are two interesting stats that I found out that was kind of showing their woes. Every Carolina Panther has less than 200 yards, or I'm sorry, every Carolina Panther running back has less than 200 yards rushing, and Greg Olson, their tight end, is 7th in the league in receiving with 610 yards. That's their tight end. He's 7th in the league uh, receiving yards of 610. The next Panther on the list is 28th, and that's Calvin Benjamin with 352, I believe. So, think about that. Your tight end is your best receiver. And then everybody else, you, you have to fall to 28th to find the next Carolina Panther. There are some teams that have two or three guys on, on the team that are in the category within that span. So, And the two teams have split the last four games. I just think Arizona, they've, they're more talented. They're angry. They're, you have an angry, motivated, and more talented Cardinal team than a Carolina team that even though they're rested... They really have no confidence in themselves right now. <laughs> and just with how Arizona is, they're going to be motivated to play. They want to get back on that field. 
and they want to take it to the Panthers to say, you know what, <laughs> you're not the same Carolina Panthers that you were last year, and you're not going to uh, embarrass us two years in a row <laughs> at, at your place. We're going to embarrass you this time. So that's why I like Arizona plus two and a half, and Arizona straight up. Um, New England and Buffalo, uh, congrats to LeGarrette Blount. He became the fifth running back for the New England Patriots to have multiple 100-yard games and two touchdown games in a single season. Uh, the Pats are 6-1 or better for the second straight year. They were 7-0 and last year, 6-1 and this year. Uh, Tom Brady's been spectacular. Uh, like I said, I think he's second in the MVP race right now behind Matt Ryan uh, and ahead of Matthew Stafford. But I just think he's been playing that well. Uh, I also want to congratulate Rob Gronkowski. He tied Stanley Morgan for the most touchdowns in franchise history with 68. And I believe he'll get a 69 touchdown next week against Buffalo. And the Pats still are like these six, 1960 Browns and the 08 Redskins still have not thrown an interception the entire year, and that's in their first seven games. But I think one interesting thing about uh, the uh, Patriots is their kicker, Steven Gostowski. He's missed back-to-back uh, PATs in consecutive weeks. Um, before the last two weeks, he was 515 of 516 uh, before the last two weeks. So I think that's... I think ever since that AFC title game where he missed that extra point, which could have been the difference in the game, I think that's gotten his head, and he's hit a mental wall with that. I still think he's a, I still think he's a great kicker, and ninety, you know, ninety nine percent of the time, I would trust him to make a kick. But I think that kick from the AFC title game has gotten his head, and it's made him, you know, frazzled. And if there was one one position besides quarterback that you can easily frazzle, it's the kicker. <laughs> um. But this New England team, they're playing a Buffalo team that just got absolutely, you know, you know, heartbroken and got rocked by the Miami Dolphins. I congratulate Tyron Taylor. He has four rushing touchdowns of 10, 10 or more yards, which the most in the last two seasons. And LaShawn McCoy, uh, he injured his hamstring and he was, was out for the third quarter. But he only ended up with, I believe, 11 rushing yards, which going back through his uh, career, it is the second lowest amount of rushing yards he had in the game. Since his second year in the league, of the last, since week 17 of the 2009 season, when he had 13, when he had four rushing yards at the end of that game. And also, there was a Reggie Bush sighting. That was the first rushing touchdown uh, for Reggie Bush since week 16 of the 2014 season. Um, it, it's also the second fewest amount of rushing yards the Bills have gained on offense the entire year. They gained 67. They only gained 65, I think, week two against uh, the Jets. Yeah, against the Jets. But I'm taking New England here because they are clearly the best team in the NFL right now. It's not even close. And Buffalo, here's the fun stat, which I have confidence in. Buffalo's beaten New England and Buffalo only two times in the last 16 years. Since Tom Brady's career, when he's gone up to Buffalo, he wins about 98, 98 to 99% of the time. Only two times he's lost... Uh, I think it was 2011 and 2003 uh, when the Pats lost in Buffalo. So that's what taking New England minus 5.5 and, and New England straight up. Next game, uh, San Diego at Denver. San Diego did not lead for any of the game for the first time at all this year. But they led at the end, which mattered. <laughs> uh, and Melvin Gordon had multiple rushing touchdowns. Only the second player in the league to have that. The only other uh, running back to have multiple touch- rushing touchdowns. In a game is David Johnson. Uh, And I also thought this was interesting for San Diego. Um, They have the best record of trailing by 17 plus points on the road, uh, I think, in NFL history. Or or over a span. They are 5-19 in those games. But that's pretty impressive, though, when you think about that that circumstance. When you're on the road and you're down by 17, San Diego's won 5 of those 24 chances that that's happened. So that's pretty impressive compared to the other teams that have been in those situations. Uh, I also want to give Joey Bosa a lot of credit. Four sacks in the, la- in, the, in the last three games, his first three games. He's playing like that number three overall pick, and he's provided a tremendous spark that the Chargers needed. They're playing a Denver team that they just, you know, they played two weeks ago. So this is very interesting. You always love these two division games within three weeks kind of scenarios. Um, and the last time San Diego won, just in week six, the Broncos' 15-game road division streak was snapped. Uh, and they were held to under 20 points in the last two games since 2011. And I think, again, it would be 2011 
when they go for a third game where they were held under 20 points. Uh, and San Diego was trying to sweep Denver for the first time since the 2010 season. Uh, I don't think it'll happen because I think Denver, they know what San Diego's like. I know San Diego has an offense which can put up points on anybody, and they're the best 3-4 and four team in the NFL, and arguably you could say in one of the best 3-4 and four teams in NFL history with how many chances they've had to win games and the games they've won over the last two weeks. Uh, that's why I like San Diego plus 6.5 because taking San Diego with the points, they're always going to put it within a 3-4 to four point game uh, most weeks. So I think 6.5 is way too many to trust Denver with. Uh, but I like Denver here because they're at home, and I think having that home field advantage will be the difference. And Phillip Rivers hasn't won in Denver since 2013, so hopefully Simeon can you know learn from the tape and play a better game for the uh, Broncos to win. That's what I like San Diego plus 6.5 and, and Denver straight up. The next game, uh, Green Bay at Atlanta. Aaron Rodgers at the Green Bay Packers record for most completions in a single game with 39. Uh, Ty Montgomery, uh, Devontae Adams, and Randall Cobb became the second trio in NFL history with 10-plus receptions each, so kudos to them. Uh, even though, again, they played the hapless Chicago Bears, who, when Brian Hoyer went down, the game was over, and Matt Barkley, the bum, is, you know, going to probably quarterback them this week, which is, which is you know, very sad. So, but kudos to the Packers, though, for finding, you know, having some confidence and playing a, you know, solid second half. They're playing an Atlanta team, though, that uh, Atlanta has three defensive touchdowns for the year, which is tied for Buffalo for most in the league. And also, uh, Julio Jones had 100 yards, or one had 100 plus yards at the end of the half for the fourth time, which is most in the NFL. And also, uh, Matt Ryan and Julio Jones is the deadliest combo in the NFL right now. They both lead the NFL in passing yards and receiving yards, respectively. But I think here is the problem. I'm taking Green Bay because I trust Green Bay's defense a little bit more. Because even though, again, Atlantic will score on the Green Bay Packers. They will. <laughs> uh, besides the Denver Broncos game, when they played Paxton Lynch, uh, Atlanta's defense has given up 26-plus points to every one of their opponents. And every, every opponent on the road has scored, I believe, at least over 30 points. Or at home. You had the game against Tampa where they put up 31, Carolina put up 33, and San Diego just put up 33 themselves. So this defense is pathetic. And it's kind of like they're the Oakland of the NFC. I love their offense. I trust their quarterback. I trust their receiving core. Uh, they have a better running game than Oakland. And they have a solid offensive line. But that defense can't stop anybody. And uh, that's going to be their downfall. And I think the Packers, uh, th their weapons will, will be s possibly be able to get open against this Atlanta defense. And with Rodgers playing the way he is, he's won four straight in Atlanta or against the Falcons. And I think with that confidence, that should be enough for the Green Bay Packers to win a game that they need to win over a quality team to gain some confidence, especially over the last uh, few weeks with the struggles they've had. So that's why I like uh, Green Bay plus 2.5 and, and Green Bay straight up. Eagles and Cowboys. The Eagles have outscored their opponents by 20.3 points per game at home. And they're 4-0 at home. And uh, in their road games... Their uh, two road games, they've, uh, or in their three road games, they beat Chicago 29-17. They lost uh, to uh, Detroit 24-23, and they lost to uh, Washington 27-20. Uh, and they're the only team in the NFL with kickoff touchdowns. Uh, Josh Huff and Wendell Smallwood are the only two guys to have kickoff return touchdowns for the entire league. Uh, and even though the Eagles' defense did a great job, their offense didn't do so well, didn't do that well. The Eagles had a season high turnovers on both offense and defense with four. They caused four turnovers, and they coughed up four turnovers themselves. Uh, Carson Wentz, he's played absolutely horrid the last two weeks. 27 of 50, 317 yards, one TD, and two interceptions. Uh, and they're going up against a Dallas team that's rested. They're relaxed. Uh, they, they're playing the best running back in the NFL right now in Ezekiel Elliott. They're leading the league, he's leading the league in rushing or right now, I believe. Um, this offensive line is the best offensive line in football. Dak Prescott going into his last game against the Packers. He was the eighth rookie quarterback to win in Lambeau, and he was the first rookie quarterback to win in Lambeau since Matt Ryan did in 2008. Uh, and Dallas is looking for a three-game home winning streak for the first time since the 2014 season. And Philly and Dallas have split the last six games. 
So when I look at this game, um, Philly, they're, they're going to put up a fight. This is Dallas. You can throw away the records. You can throw away, you know, talent. They're going to be able to play Dallas really well. I just think it's something where I've seen Dak Prescott. He's motivated. He's relaxed. He's going into a big Sunday night stage against the division rival. And I think he knows this is his team now moving forward for the rest of the year. And I just think Dak's going to play. Dak's shown that he's played efficient football pretty much all the way through. Even even the uh, Green Bay game, which was his worst, he played efficient football. Um, and I haven't seen that from Carson Wentz over the last two weeks. I think Carson Wentz, he's going to make one throw or he's going to have one pressure on him that he's going to make a mistake or he, the Dallas defense will cause a fumble or two, which will be the difference in the game. I think it'll be close, so I'm going to think it's a three-point or four-point game. That was like Philadelphia plus four and a half. But I like Dallas straight up because Dak's not going to, you know, Dak's going to feel confident. He's not going to make that many big mistakes or not throw that many, you know, high, you know, powered bombs that can be picked like I saw Carson Wentz do in the first two drives of the game against Minnesota. And I just think Dallas, they're the better overall team, and they've shown that this year. And if they win, they could make an argument to be the best team in the NFC. So that's why I like Philadelphia, plus four and a half, and Dallas straight up. And finally, uh, Vikings at Bears. 57 drives to the Vikings going into the game against Philadelphia where they didn't commit a turnover. They committed two turnovers in their first two drives. <laughs> uh, but this game is fairly easy. Uh, they're playing Chicago at home. Or they get they have to go to Chicago. They're playing Matt Barkley, who for his career, 55.6% completion, zero touchdowns, six interceptions, 381 total passing yards. Is there anything else I need to add? <laughs> you know, Minnesota, they are not that bad, and they are going to take it out on this Bears team, which is the weakest and saddest thing in Chicago right now. Thank God the Cubs are in the World Series so Chicago fans can smile and look forward to something instead of this uh, <laughs> horrible wasted year by the Chicago Bears. And I do believe John Fox should be fired at the end of the year. He should be. He had two years. You know what? He brought in this talent. That was his call. You know, GM had to, you know, talk to maybe about Forte and all that. But again, the coach had to know that they were doing that too. Um, and I think, again, just of how pathetic they've been, it's time for John Fox to go because, again, two years like this, you just can't have it. There, there has to be some sort of change. So, um, I like Minnesota minus five and straight up here just because Minnesota is, a, is the clearly better team and Matt Barkley starting at quarterback. That's all you need to know. So, those are my thoughts and picks for this week. Like, comment, rate, subscribe. Best of luck to all the teams, all the players, all the coaches, all fantasy players and fellow prognosticators. And until next week, Week 9, this is Matt the Fanatic signing off. Until then, so long.